Well, we're blessed to have a plethora, waiting to use that word for a while. We have a plethora of ministers in our church. We have, a, I think it's about nine or ten uh, ministers in this church. It's, a, it's an unusually high number for a church this size. But uh, quite a few ministers that are capable of teaching, and today we're going to hear from one of our very own. As you've already seen, he's the pastor of our junior high group, and I know he's got a special word from the Lord today. Would you welcome our own Pastor Chad Becker? exciting Sunday it has been. I was talking to uh, Pastor Paul earlier uh, and asking him, if, can we cram any more into this service this morning? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's uh, really awesome to be part of a church that, uh, oh, my mic is not on apparently. Uh, there we go. Is that hello, testing? And Pastor Paul said that you know he let me use his special mic. Well, wow. it's not very special, is it? <laughs> oh well, guess. Uh, so I may not be then, okay. <laughs> anyway, but uh, it's so great to be up here, uh, just to be able to, to share the message with you this morning. And uh, it's something that I have, God has put on my heart for, uh, for a while now. And so I'm uh, just glad that I get to, to share it with you this morning. Uh, so, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that is happening in our church Thank you for the growth. Thank you for the spiritual growth that is happening. God, just bless this message today. Let it be your words, not mine. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this morning I want to share a message with you entitled Defending Holy Ground. And so we're going to take a look at what holy ground is. We're going to take a look at its significance in our lives, and finally, how to defend holy ground, our call to action, if you will. And before we get into that, I, I need you to understand that this holy ground that I'm talking about is under attack, and we are in a war. And there are lives that are hanging in the balance here. This is a battle for souls. And on one side, there we go. On one side, you've got God and Jesus and the angels of heaven and his devout followers, us, the church. And then on the other side, you've got Satan and his demons and those that are not part of the body of Christ. And it's a battle for the ages. And, you know, as we look across our country and the world, it just seems like we are in a losing battle. It just seems like we're on the losing side. And you know, Satan, he uses many avenues to wage war against us. Take TV, for example. The news specifically. You know, when the news first came out, when TV first came out, there were only three news networks. ABC, NBC, and CBS. That's right, yes, CBS. And so when the news was happening, it was only an evening news. And it was actual news. And it was like a, a family affair. Everyone would gather on the television set and watch the news. And then something happened. June 1st, 1980, CNN came online, and we began having the first 24-hour news cycle. And so competition between news networks became increasingly large. 
And so now you have more sensational and more shocking headlines. And so those stories that were not normally covered were all of a sudden front page news. And this is all in an attempt to do one thing, to grab your eyeballs. Because if the enemy can get you to focus on anything that is not God, he, can, he will do it. Then, of course, we've got social media. And Satan, he is an expert at offering us shortcuts. You know, just as he tempted Jesus in the wilderness to satisfy his hunger by making, stone, making bread out of stones, you know, so he tempts us to satisfy our need for community by appealing to social media. No, I mean, we have been so connected. At no point in history have we been this connected in our, in our society. But yet, as connected as we are, we're so alone. We're so depressed. We're just so broken. And it's very sad. Next we have education. And I'd like to read an article that I came across uh, from the Washington Examiner. It reads, a nine-year-old girl in Massachusetts has questions for her mother one afternoon upon arriving home from school. She asks, what does bisexual mean? It turns out the school librarian read a book to the class about Harvey Milk and the history of the rainbow flag and gave a directive to the eight and nine-year-olds to remember the letters LGBTQ. The parents contacted school officials and said the lesson fell under the appropriate school standards for history and social sciences, and the librarian was highly qualified to host a variety of age-appropriate conversations. You know, we've got this tension playing out all across our country. You know, the fact that we've got curriculum being released about sexual orientation and gender identity, it, it's, it's becoming the norm. And it's, it's a problem. There's a lot of tension going on. Not only that, we've got drag queens reading to kids in libraries in, across New York City. And Pastor Paul mentioned this in an earlier message. The Duke University School of Divinity hosted a chapel service back in March and praise to the great queer one. I mean, folks, we've got a serious problem in our country and in our world. And Satan is waging a huge war against us. So what is this holy ground that I have mentioned earlier? Well, as always, we need to go to the Word of God to see what it has to say. So we come across this term for the first time in the book of Exodus with the story of Moses and the burning bush. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am. Moses replied, do not come any closer. The Lord warned, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. And the Bible also mentions of more places and more locations that become holy. Take, for example, the temple. But as for me and your abundant loving kindness, I will enter your house at your holy temple. I will bow in reverence for you, it says in Psalm 5-7. Take Mount Sinai. The Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain, and the Lord told Moses, Go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord, or they will die. Even the priests who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain and set it apart as holy. And then the tabernacle. Hang the inner curtain from the clasps and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. This curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Now, something about all of these different places is these places, they did not just become holy because of their location or because of what they were made of. And the temple was made of some impressive things, gold and gems and 
fine linen. No, they became holy because a holy God and his presence dwelt there. Now, I've mentioned up to this point, you know, things and places that are holy. But there's one other thing that can be made holy. People, you and I, we can be made holy. And I need you to understand the, the big picture here. You see, a loving God gave us a choice. He gave us free will. We can choose to love God and to serve him, or we can choose not to. We can choose to not have God in our lives. And we see this with the story of Adam and Eve in the beginning. God gave Adam and Eve a choice. And Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And as a result, sin and death entered the world. And because of that, when we are born into this world, the Bible says that we are born as sinners. Unfortunately, that's just how it is. And Paul talks about this in, in Romans chapter 3. He says, for all have sinned and fallen short. And, and again, you know, no one is righteous. And, and I love how Isaiah 64, 6 from the message puts this. It says, we're all sin-infected, sin-contaminated. Our best efforts are grease-stained rags. Folks, we're filthy. But what's cool is we have a loving God who created a rescue plan for us, the plan of salvation, where if we choose to accept Christ into our lives, we can be made holy. Because it's, when we accept Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes inside our hearts and dwells in our hearts and makes us holy. And that's the holy ground that I'm talking about this morning. So what's the big deal about holiness? Why is holiness so important? Well, the first thing is our witness. Matthew chapter 5, 13 to 19 says, For you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that you will praise your heavenly Father. You know, Jesus, he's called us to be salt and light to the earth. And so when you are around your coworkers or your non-Christian friends, can they tell that you're a Christian without you actually saying that you're a Christian? If not, maybe we need to reevaluate how we're living our lives. And, and you know, I, the world looks at the church and most of the time they see a bunch of hypocrites, unfortunately. And in the same day, you know, we come to church, we worship God, oh, praise Jesus, God is good. And then in a few hours we go to a restaurant and we may cuss out the wait staff because they're not waiting to our expectations. You know, we've got to be careful with how we're living our lives, how we are acting, because, you know, our actions should point people to Christ. Our witness, it's all that we have. And so if we're not living correctly, then we're not reaching people for Christ very well, are we? So the next significant reason is heaven, our eternal home. Jesus says in, in John chapter 14, his father's house, are, in his father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you with me so where you are, there you may be also. And the Bible describes heaven as a place of paradise, a better country, a place with streets of gold and precious gems and all that. But it will also be a place of peace. A place of peace. 
don't know about you, but I could use more peace in my life. Couldn't you? Absolutely. And in Revelation chapter 24, it says, He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And we need more peace in our world. The world is so full of, of wars and just all kinds of other things. We really need more peace. And heaven is going to be a place of peace. Is there anybody that's a Jeremy Camp fan? Yeah, I really like Jeremy Camp. And Jeremy Camp has a song that's entitled, There Will Be a Day. And I'd like to read the lyrics for you, because I really love the lyrics to this song. And it says, I try to hold on to this world with everything I have, but I feel the weight of what it brings and the hurt that tries to grab. The many trials that seem to never end, his word declares this truth that we will enter in his rest with wonders anew. But I hold on to his hope and the promise that he brings that there will be a place with no more suffering. There will be a day with no more tears, no more pain, and no more fears. There will be a day when the burdens of this place will be no more. We'll see Jesus face to face. But until that day comes, we'll hold on to you always. And I really love that song because it ties in very well with this. No more tears, no more pain, no more fears. I don't know about you guys, but I can't wait to be in heaven with Jesus. Okay, so we looked at, we defined what holy ground is. When the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and dwells in our heart and, and makes it holy. And we looked at the significance it has in our lives. So now we need to look at how it is that we defend the holy ground that's inside of us. And I, I want to share a goal of mine. One of my goals in life is to uh, get my dive certification, hence some of these wonderful, lovely props here. Um, and so through the fire department, I can do that, which is really awesome. But I think it'd be really cool to swim in the ocean and swim with all the fish and everything. Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, I'm so jealous. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I really think that that would be so cool to do. So let's play a game. We're going to play a game called Guess the Animal, or Guess the Sea Creature. So let's see how well your knowledge is. What is this? Octopus, that's right. So this is called the blue-ringed octopus for some unknown reason. And this is about the size of your hand, and it's poisonous. So you definitely do not want to step on it or, or mess with it in any kind of way. About this one? The puffer fish, that's right. So when this guy feels threatened, he'll puff up to make himself look twice as large. I mean, it's in the name, puffer fish. What about this guy? Clownfish. Clownfish, that's right. So this fish lives in a sea anemone. And predators will stay away because they know that anemones sting and hurt. And so the clownfish has a special uh, mucus on, on it that protects it from getting stung by the anemone. So a cool symbiotic relationship there. What about this guy? A crab, that's right. So this is the boxer crab, and the boxer crab has, you know, pinchers like most crabs do, but he also has anemones on his pinchers, again, to ward off predators. And what about this? Eel. An eel, that's right. So this is an electric eel, and I guess you can imagine what this guy does when he feels threatened. He shocks his predators. Uh, lots of volts there. So, but there's, there's a reason why I mention all of these creatures, and it's because we have something in common with them. You see, all these creatures, they're not at the top of the food chain. And so they always have predators that are trying to eat them. And so they always need to be on their guard. So this way, they're not a meal. And it's just like us. We have an enemy, the devil. 
And the Bible says that the devil's out to steal, kill, and destroy. So I'd like to read to you how it is that we defend against the enemy. I'm going to read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the armor of God. Because Paul lays out for us in the book of Ephesians how it is that we can defend against the devil. He gives us a strategy. You know, just like God has given those animals a strategy to defend against their enemies, so God gives us a strategy in his word to defend against ours. So from Ephesians chapter 6, it says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body uh, armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of, of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times, in the spirit and on every occasion stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere now paul here he's writing to the church of ephesus from a jail so this is one of paul's prison letters and the book of ephesians he lays out for us very clearly the the basics of the christian walk christian conduct how we should act and in this final section of the letter here he begins with the word finally, which basically means in light of what was previously written. So in light of all that God has done for you, in light of the glorious standing we have as a child of God, in light of God's great plan that he made us a part of, in light of the conduct God has called every believer to, in light of all this, there is a battle to fight, put on your armor. And Paul reminds us in this passage here that we are soldiers in God's army. And soldiers, they go through something called basic training. And basic training is there for a reason because it's there to sharpen the soldier's skills, to help them become stronger, help them be more disciplined. And so... When we go through basic training, by the time we're through with that, we're stronger than we were before. And it's like the military is saying, hey guys, so we're going to give you some real expensive weapons. We just want to make sure you know how to use them first. But we as Christians, you know, we have our own basic training. Reading the Word of God. And I always tell the junior high students this, you've got to read the Word. You've got to read it because it is so life-changing. And it's not going to change your life one time. It'll change it again and again and again because it's living and it's active. So reading the Word and being in prayer and being in community with one another, other believers. Because you see, you know, war isn't a joke. And Satan isn't a joke either. And we can't fight him on our own. We need God's help. And God gives us that help through his armor. And it's a unique armor. It's a powerful armor. That same armor that God gives us, the same power, is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And we get the privilege of using it. And so Paul, he goes on to talk about the individual pieces of armor. And, and he lists them in the order that a soldier would put them on which is pretty awesome. And I'm going to mention them a little brief here because this is a whole other sermon. 
And, uh, you know, I think it's awesome that there's a Bible study coming up on the armor of God. Kind of ironic how that worked out. So, but the belt of truth. The belt keeps garments in place, and it protects the abdomen, and it puts the soldier in a battle-ready state of mind. Think about a, a police officer that has their, their belt with their gun and their nightstick and uh, their taser. Whenever a police officer puts that on, they're in a battle-ready state of mind. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness protects the vital organs like the heart. And in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart above all else. The heart is like our control center. It dictates our motives. And without our heart being in the right place, you know, it, it needs to be protected above all other things. And the shoes, no one can effectively go without proper shoes, proper grip. And one of the reasons why the Roman soldiers were so effective in battle was because they had proper footwear. It was like they were wearing spikes on their feet to better grip the terrain that they were encountering, that they were fighting on. You know, we must be ready to go with the truth. We must be ready at any moment to share the gospel. And all of these, all of these pieces of armor are the foundational pieces. The next one is hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the enemy. And Paul here, he's not referring to like a Captain America kind of shield, the round one. When Paul is talking about a shield, he's talking about those really long ones that cover the entire body. Because one of the things that ancient warriors would do is before they would send out their soldiers to invade, they would launch arrows. And that was in an attempt to cause confusion and to cause fear. And so shields were made to protect against those fiery darts. And the enemy has all kinds of fiery darts that he is throwing our way. Discouragement. Fears. All kinds of lies. Imaginations. And we've got to take these things captive by the power of Christ. Next, putting on the helmet of salvation. Helmet protects the head. And the helmet of salvation protects us against discouragement and the desire to give up. You know, we have hope in knowing that we are saved and God will be triumphant. And discouragement is one of the enemy's most effective weapons because if he can cause us to be discouraged, then he can cause us to give up. And we do not want to give up in this fight. We can't. We cannot afford to. Too much is at stake. And finally, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword is a very powerful weapon. And the sword takes a lot of skill to use. Soldiers practice their moves with that very often, so that this way, when it comes time for battle, they can recall all those moves and be able to win the duel. And there's all kinds of really great movies with sword fights in it that I'm sure you guys remember. Um, and it's just like, they're going at it, and they're, you know, trying to, even with Star Wars, you know, the, the Jedis and, and the Siths and stuff, uh, trying to, to win. So the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, we've got to know how to use the Word of God. That is our sword. And because the Bible is the sword, we've got to be confident in the Word and believe that it's truth and life. And that can be pretty challenging sometimes because as we're going through tough circumstances, our feelings kind of dictate what we believe. And we've got to get away from that and believe that no matter what, that the Scripture is truth, that God's promises are true. 
And the last thing that Paul urges us to do in this, after we put on the armor, is Paul urges us to pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray all kinds of ways. Pray in a group. Pray silently. If you want to shout a prayer, shout a prayer. Walk, kneel, have a groaning prayer. Pray all kinds of ways, Paul is saying. Because we, once we have the armor on, now we need to put the prayer on. Get our prayer on. Because it is prayer and armor that go together as we go out to fight our battles. And you know, sometimes we don't pray because we're overconfident in our own abilities. And we get into trouble with that because our own abilities, we just can't measure up compared to the abilities that God provides. And we get ourselves in hot water. But we not only pray for ourselves, but for others. And if you look at a soldier when they're out on the battlefield, they're not only concerned with their own safety, but they're concerned with the safety of their brothers that are fighting along with them. And so we need to pray for one another, pray on each other's behalf, because we are all fighting this battle. And some of us are fighting different battles, but we all need to pray for one another, encourage each other, and lift each other up as we, as we are fighting this war. You know, and the, the devil, he's really waging an incredible battle here. And we just, we really need to remember the strategy that God has in his word to put on the armor. Put on the armor and to pray. Because our world needs us to be battle ready. Our neighbors need us to be battle ready. Worship team. Would you show them your appreciation? That was a great message. Thank you, Pastor Chad. What a wonderful analogy. I especially connected when he showed the, um, the sea creatures. And honestly, I knew, I knew he was going to do that. And I'll admit to you now that when you walked me through that before, I didn't quite get it. But now I do. <laughs> and I think that was one of the things that connected me uh, with me the most is that our Heavenly Father, the creator of all things, was so careful to provide even the sea creatures with defense mechanisms right it, it, when they showed the crab did any of you say that's my spouse in the morning no but if he's that specific to give even those sea creatures a defense mechanism would he not do that for his own children I like that I like that because he has not only done that for all of those sea creatures, he's done that for us. He's given us a defense system. And not only a defense system, but a system of war, not vicious war to hurt other people, war to fight the enemy and see people that are lost saved and come into the kingdom of God. Show Pastor Chad your appreciation one more time. We're going to do something. Um, are the, are, is Pastor Liz and the kids down yet? They were, somebody needs to go get them because Pastor Chad didn't preach as long as I do. And um, so they were gonna be down here at 12. See, they were just not expecting be finished that fast but we're going to just transition into um, a time another time of worship and that's baptism and baptism is a public event I have to take this camera out there it's feeding back on me it's okay um, it's a public event and I know that some of you will be tempted to get in your cars and go on but I'm gonna ask you not to do that we have four kids that are gonna get 
baptized, and um, it's important for us to witness that baptism. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. Uh, these young children, even at their young age, have decided, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to spend the rest of my life living for Him. And that is a public confession of their faith. And then as they're baptized, they go down into the water that you know, just signifies Jesus being buried in the tomb, but He was resurrected in a resurrected body. And that will be the case for all of us for eternity that are Christians to live in heaven. And it also signifies them being resurrected to a new life, a life that is um, led by the Holy Spirit. So as these young people uh, make that profession of faith, I, I pray that we would all cheer them on as they're baptized and that we would all um, you know, we're a community just like the baby dedication, you know, walking alongside parents, raising their children, helping them. Uh, these people that are baptized, it's, uh, it's our responsibility, too, to say, you know, I remember the day that you made your public confession of faith before the whole congregation and uh, hold them accountable to that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to exit through this door and the baptism tank is set up outside under the carport out here and uh, we're just going to go on ahead and transition out there and uh, participate in baptism but let's let's just pray one more time father over this beautiful message that has been declared from your word how you uh, call us to defend holy ground like pastor chad so eloquently uh, displayed for us that the um, the tabernacle, Mount Sinai, the place of the burning bush, just like they were holy ground, we are holy ground. Because of your Holy Spirit in us, your presence in us, we have become holy ground. The gospel of Jesus Christ is holy ground. This church, not this building, this body, the church is holy ground. And I pray that we would contend for the faith and defend that holy ground. And not just be defensive, but be offensive in the fight for more souls for the kingdom of God. I pray that would be every one of our mission as we go back into the world this week. And it's in Jesus' precious name we all pray. And I pray your blessing over this time of baptism. That these precious young souls would be forever changed. And that we as a church would cheer them on and encourage them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. And right, we can go on out this side door.
with the little poppet fidget things. One center was with art. One center was with Legos because you can play Legos and talk to God at the same time. So we were doing all of those things. And after I explained it all, I think it was Riker raised his hand and says, so we're just having fun today. <laughs> yes, fun talking to God. That's what we're doing today. That's what church is all about. So anyway, we're going to have to all. your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, 
Okay, on your profession of faith record, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. days of your life yes. okay all right so i need you to kneel down i know <laughs> i know <laughs> Kids, one more round of applause. Well, God bless you guys. You are officially dismissed, but I want to encourage you not to run off. Take some time. Talk to somebody that you haven't met yet. Get to know their name. And remember, we're family, right? God bless you guys. Have a great rest of your Sabbath day.